In this video, we're going over the category tonifying herbs, starting with the first section, herbs that tonify the chi. There are notes and flashcards that you can download if you want to follow along. There are links to those below. And there's also a practice test you can take afterwards. And this video is brought to you by the TCM Study Single Herb Review Course. In this video, we're going to be going over the herbs in a very in-depth way, which is great if you're taking an herbology course and you've never seen this information before. But if you're studying for a big comprehensive test, like finals, year ends, or boards, you'll probably want more of a quick review. And that's what the single herbs review course is for. This course goes over all of the herbs and just hits on the key points you need to know for each one so you can review everything in a quick, efficient manner. So if you're studying for a big test, check out the single herb review course. Link to that is below. So this is herbs that tonify the chi. And when you talk about tonifying the chi, we're mainly talking about two different systems, the lung and the spleen. Because remember, these are our sources of postnatal chi. The lung is where we get the da chi, the chi of the air. And the spleen is where you get the gu shui chi, the chi of grain and water or the chi from the food that we eat. So when we look at the herbs in this category, we're normally talking about these two organ systems. So if we're dealing with lung chi deficiency, what does that look like? Well, we could have shortness of breath. Remember, the lung governs respiration. So if we don't have enough chi in the lung, the lung can't take in the air. Or the lung has problems getting in air. So we'll have shortness of breath or you can get easily out of breath with little exertion because you don't have enough chi for the lung to control respiration. You can have a low faint voice or a soft voice. So this is something that you can look for when you see a patient is do they have a loud shouting voice? Does their voice project? That's probably more of an excess condition. Whereas if they have a low soft voice, it's like they don't have enough chi for their voice to get out. They don't have enough chi to project the sound of their voice. So lung chi deficiency can present with a low faint voice. We can have a forceless cough. And again, this is going to, um, you can think about this as excess versus deficiency. If we have an excess heat pathogen or if we have excess phlegm in the lung, the person will usually have a, a loud barking cough or a loud hacking cough with a lot of force behind it, indicating excess. But if we're dealing with lung chi deficiency, this is going to be like a very quiet, forceless cough, like a <clears throat> kind of a chronic, always there type of thing. Um, Again, this is like the, the lung doesn't have enough chi to down bear the, the chi of the air, so it rebels back upwards in this chronic weak cough. And then we can also have spontaneous sweating. So one way you can think about this is remember, one of the functions of chi is containment or holding things in. So if the lung chi is deficient, a, the lung chi can no longer contain the fluids and the fluids leak out. Or you can think about this in terms of the lung governs the exterior, the lung governs the interstices, the soli spaces, or we could say the lung governs the opening and closing of the pores. And so if there's lung chi deficiency, the interstices become unsound, the lung chi can't hold those pores closed, and so the sweat leaks out. So we have spontaneous sweating or sweating with little exertion. Uh, kind of related to this, we can talk about the lung governing the exterior and the Wei Qi. So if the lung Qi is deficient, the Wei Qi might be deficient. And not only is the sweat leaking out, but it's very easy for pathogens to get in. So kind of along with spontaneous sweating, we can say that the patient gets sick very easily. Sometimes this happens like, especially when with uh, patients will come in with their children and they'll say, oh, my child gets sick every month, every time somebody at school is sick, they catch it. So they have a, because they have a weak immune system or they get sick very easily, that could indicate uh, the Wei Qi is not strong, strong enough to keep the pathogens out. And we can kind of attribute that to deficient lung Qi. The other one we can talk about is the spleen. Again, the spleen is where we get our nutrients. The spleen digests the food. It's our source of chi from grain and water. So if spleen chi is deficient, we could see things like lethargy or weak extremities. Basically, you're not digesting your food. You don't have enough, uh, enough energy, so you feel tired. You feel lethargic. We say weak extremities. Remember, we said that the spleen governs the four limbs. So if spleen chi is deficient, we can't lift the four limbs. We don't, the spleen governs the flesh or the muscles. So we don't have that muscular strength to lift the four limbs. So sometimes I've heard people say this where it's like, 
like massage therapists. It's like, after I do one or two massages, like I can't lift my arms. I can no longer hold my arms up. We could say that's weakness in the extremities or weakness of the four limbs. And something interesting here that Wiseman will point out is that when we say lethargy, we don't just mean um, the person is physically tired or physically fatigued. We can also say lassitude of spirit, as in they, they're just not energetic or they don't have a lot of motivation. So that could be spleen chi deficiency. We can also see poor appetite or indigestion. The spleen is responsible for uh, digestion. The spleen stomach rots and ripens the food and moves it through the digestive system. So if you don't have enough spleen chi, your spleen can't break down the food. So, so it's like because the food's not being broken down, you don't really have cravings for more. So you have poor appetite or low appetite. And then if there's not enough energy to break that down and move it through the system, we can have indigestion, like upset stomach, nausea, vomiting, stuff's not moving through because there's not enough chi to keep things moving. Uh, we could have loose stools or diarrhea. Again, if we could think of this as the spleen is not digesting the food properly, the spleen is not transforming the food, so it comes out kind of untransformed. Or we could think about this in terms of dampness, that the spleen has an action of transforming dampness. So if spleen chi is deficient, it fails in its function of transforming dampness, so that comes out in the stools with loose stool or diarrhea. And then um, we can also have sinking conditions, so like prolapse. And so this is another one when we talk about the middle jowl, we say the spleen has an upward direction. It's supposed to raise the clear yang or raise the clear chi, whereas the stomach has a downward direction. It's supposed to down bear the food into the small intestine and keep things moving through. So if spleen chi is deficient, it can fail to raise the clear yang. And so with that, we can get certain sinking conditions like organ prolapse, uterine prolapse, rectal prolapse, or sometimes it's just the clear chi isn't rising, so we end up with um, turbidity in, in the upper body. So we might have some dizziness or headache just because the clear yang isn't rising up to the head because of the spleen chi deficiency. Um, this can also include things like um, uh, menstruation issues like profuse menses could be a sinking condition or even a frequent miscarriage could be considered a sinking condition as well. And then we can say superficial edema. Again, the spleen has a uh, function of transforming dampness. So a spleen chi is deficient and it fails to transform dampness. That dampness can accumulate and we can get uh, superficial edema. Or uh, I really like this. Uh, this is the term uh, Wiseman and Brand used, generalized vacuity puffiness, which I think is just kind of funny because normally Wiseman terminology is very... Uh, very hard to say, very technical, but they for this they use this term puffiness. Instead of water retention edema, we can just say the person is puffy. And so sometimes people ask, what do we mean by superficial edema or edema right under the skin? And so that's kind of, I think that's a good way to sum it up is we're talking about puffiness. Um, sometimes edema is so superficial that if you're doing acupuncture, when you stick a needle in, some of that fluid will leak out through through the hole that you punctured. And so that's what we mean by uh, superficial edema, or we're going to say generalized puffiness due to spleen deficiency. The spleen isn't transforming the fluids or transforming dampness, so that accumulates right under the skin, giving us puffiness. So these are the main signs and symptoms we're going to be looking for in this category. When we talk about herbs that tonify the chi, we're mainly talking about tonifying lung chi and tonifying spleen chi. So these are the symptoms we're going to look for for lung chi deficiency and spleen chi deficiency. It turns out we can also have other types of chi deficiency. These just aren't majorly addressed in this category. So we can have heart chi deficiency. So here we might see things like palpitations or chest oppression or um, kind of like fullness in the chest, just because the, the chi is not there to help the heart beat smoothly is maybe a way you can think about it. And then we might see an irregular pulse. I think with all of these, we're going to see kind of like a weak pulse or a deficient pulse. But with heart symptoms, we can also see an irregular pulse. And here when we say an irregular pulse, we mean a pulse that skips beats. And with heart chi deficiency, we're looking for a slow irregular pulse or a regularly irregular pulse. So when you talk about irregular pulses, there are three different types. But one of the things we're looking at is 
Does it skip a beat at regular intervals, like every fifth beat it drops uh, drops a beat? Or does it skip beats at irregular intervals, like it'll go three and then stop, and then seven and then stop, and then five and then stop? So for heart chi deficiency, when we say an irregular pulse, we're specifically talking about a regularly irregular pulse, or a pulse that skips beats at regular intervals. And one of the ways we explain this is you can think about uh, kind of like a, a tired old man who's going for a walk that he's very weak, so he takes five steps and then has to stop and rest. And then he starts going again and he takes five steps and he has to stop and rest. And so that's what's happening with the pulses. Because the chi is deficient, it's not able to move the blood through the vessel, so it has to stop at regular intervals to take a rest before going further. And so this is just to differentiate from other things like excess heat or fire can cause an irregular pulse, but that's more irregularly irregular. So anyway, heart chi deficiency is something that we can talk about as well, but really in this category, there are only like two, maybe three herbs that we talk about for heart chi deficiency. And normally when it comes to heart patterns, we're more likely to diagnose like heart blood deficiency or heart yin deficiency or something like that. But so this isn't something that we commonly see in this category, but it will come up in one or two herbs. So we could pay attention to that because that makes it stand out. And then something we can also talk about is kidney chi deficiency. And this is another one that's kind of weird because normally when we talk about the kidneys, we say the kidneys are the root of all yin and yang in the body. So normally when we talk about the kidneys, we are talking about kidney yin deficiency, kidney yang deficiency, or kidney essence. So what do we mean by kidney chi? Well, on the one hand, we can think about kidney chi. Chi has this action of transformation. So we can say it's the kidney chi that is transforming the fluids. Or we can say that the kidney has something to do with urination and that there's this gate that has to open and close to let the urine out or keep the urine in. And so that's what kidney chi is doing. That's what powers that opening and closing or uh, letting out and holding in the urine. So we can think of kidney chi as that way. Uh, but one of the simple ways uh, one of my teachers explained it is when we say kidney deficiency, kidney chi deficiency, that specifically means kidney yang deficiency plus leakage. So here we're going to see certain leakage problems like frequent urination, nighttime urination, or incontinence. We could see seminal emission, nocturnal emission, spermatorrhea, premature ejaculation, or we could see things like vaginal discharge. So leakage of fluids and leakage of essence. So those are the types of things we're talking about when we say kidney chi deficiency. But it turns out we have a separate category that for, for these types of conditions. Since kidney chi deficiency, it's kind of implied that there's some kidney yang deficiency as well. So we're gonna talk about these things under the category herbs that tonify yang. So yes, we can technically say there's such a thing as kidney chi deficiency, but it's just we're not really gonna see it come up in this category. Um, here we can also talk about the kidney having to grasp the lung chi. We could also talk about that as kidney chi. But um, basically when we get into this category, most of the herbs are gonna be talking about lung chi deficiency and or spleen chi deficiency with these types of signs and symptoms. And we might occasionally see one or two herbs for heart chi deficiency as well. So that's what we're dealing with in this category, herbs that tonify chi. This slide, I think we just, um, this summarizes everything we talked about, spleen chi deficiency, lung chi deficiency, um, the failure to transform fluids can result in edema, uh, or we can have some sinking conditions due to organ prolapse. And so we look at the properties of either, the taste is going to be sweet, because remember the sweet flavor tonifies. The temperature is usually going to be warm because chi has a warming function, so most of these herbs are just warm in temperature. The main channels are going to be the lung and the spleen, because like we said, those are sources of postnatal chi. We might occasionally see some things that enter the heart channel or the kidney channel, but by and large, most of these enter uh, both the lung and the spleen, or at least one or the other. Some cautions and contraindications that these herbs are sweet, rich, and cloying. And this is something that we generally say about the tonifying category in general, that these herbs, because they tonify, they tend to be sweet, they can easily cause digestive problems because they're sweet, sticky, cloying nature. 
or uh, when we tonify, it can easily cause stagnation. Like if we just pile more chi into there, we need to make sure that the chi is moving so it doesn't become stagnant. So we're gonna wanna combine these herbs with herbs that regulate the chi or herbs that move the chi. And we're also gonna have to be careful to look out for any signs of digestive problems. And then we also say excessive or chronic use may cause fullness in the chest or heat signs. And so again, this is because they're sweet, they kind of have some cloying nature, so it can easily cause some stagnation. But it's also these herbs are, very, are usually warm, so long-term or high dosages can easily cause heat signs. And this is something that you see sometimes, I think it especially happens in younger people when you have someone like in their 20s and they start doing uh, qigong and tai chi and they start getting into qi cultivation. They're like, oh, I wanna take all these qi tonics. And it turns out like they're not actually very chi deficient. They don't need to tonify their chi. If anything, they just need to make sure that the chi that they have is circulating properly. But so they'll go and try to take these chi tonics and it ends up just either causing stagnation or causing heat signs. Like I had one, uh, one guy in school that uh, he, he wanted to be very Taoist and cultivate his chi. So he was taking Korean red ginseng every day and he thought it wouldn't, uh, uh, give him energy, make him alert, make it so he could focus on his studies, but he ended up just giving himself heat signs because all of that all of that Korean red ginseng was just accumulating heat in the body. So that's what we want to be uh, cautious about is cautious in our dosage that we're not giving too much or not taking it too much that it might cause some heat signs. The main action of these herbs is of course to tonify chi and we're mainly talking about tonifying the chi of the spleen and the lung. And any other thing we should uh, keep in mind is like we said, we usually wanna combine these herbs uh, with herbs that move the chi or regulate chi to prevent stagnation. Both that this can cause upset stomach, we could have trouble digesting them, so we add in herbs that help with digestion, but also as we tonify that chi, we wanna make sure that it's circulating properly, so we add in herbs that regulate chi. And I think these are things that we mentioned when we talk about these categories. So Chen Pi is aged tangerine peel. That's a very common one to add in. Mu Xiang is also in the category regulate chi. And Sha Ren is cardamom seed. That's in the aromatic transform dampness category, but it also has an action of regulating chi. So those are the common herbs that we're gonna see used to, uh, that we combine with tonifying herbs to prevent stagnation and make sure things are moving properly. So here's our list of herbs. So let's get started. Oh, and then we also have a note here that about the 18 incompatible herbs. If you remember at the very beginning when we talked about combinations of herbs, uh, one of the things we talked about was the 18 incompatible herbs. When you say 18 incompatible herbs, we're talking about three different groups of herbs that are incompatibilities and the total and adds up to 18. So we should just know here that one of the herbs we're talking about here is gansao, which is licorice root. And we should know that gansao is one of our 18 incompatible herbs. So gansao is incompatible with daji, gansui, haizao, and yuanhua. Most of these herbs are from the harsh expellent category. So that's something that we just, I feel like every test I've taken, I've gotten some kind of question about the 18 incompatible herbs. So I like to bring it up now in case I forget about it later. So our first herb is Ren Shen Ginseng Radix. Ren Shen Ginseng Radix, and this is ginseng root. So Ren Shen tonifies qi, and we say that Ren Shen tonifies qi. Ren Shen tonifies all the qi. Ren Shen is our most powerful qi tonic. This is a very sought after herb. This is a very valuable herb. High quality Ren Shen could be uh, very expensive. And so, um, so what we can say is Ren Chen tonifies all the qi. So Ren Chen tonifies spleen qi for all of those things we talked about, like lethargy, poor appetite, or chronic diarrhea. Ren Chen tonifies lung qi for all those things we talked about, like wheezing, shortness of breath, labored breathing on exertion, like you get tired easily and you, you get out of breath after just walking up the stairs. Uh, Ren Chen tonifies heart qi. So this is one of the herbs that does tonify heart qi to treat those things like palpitations, anxiety, insomnia, and forgetfulness. So because heart chi is deficient, it's having a difficulty housing the shen or calming the shen. So this so ren shen is one of the herbs that tonifies heart chi. And then we also say that uh, ren shen, it's so good at tonifying chi. It's so strong at tonifying chi, it can tonify the original chi or tonify the source chi, or Bensky says tonifies the primal chi to treat chi collapse. So this is something that 
We kind of talked before in the last category, we talked about this idea of yang collapse. So we had certain herbs that can rescue devastated yang, like futsa and ganjang. Well, we have a similar thing called qi collapse uh, or qi abandonment. It's a very similar thing. We said this is similar to going into shock. It usually happens after a severe illness or if you had um, severe sweating or severe diarrhea, uh, long-standing diarrhea or uh, profuse bleeding, like due to injury and trauma and all the, uh, the blood was leaking out. So it's usually situations like this. In Western medicine, we might say the person is going into shock. In TCM, we can say, sometimes we can say the yang collapsed or the qi collapsed. And so they're very similar. I don't want to get too much into the differences between them because a lot of times they happen together that if your yang abandons you, your qi will abandon you soon after. So it's very similar that the person has cold limbs, they're sweating profusely because there's not enough qi to hold in the fluid, so their sweat is pouring out. Uh, they can be curled up into the fetal position or curled up into the shrimp position where they can have a pulse that's uh, faint or minute. And so Again, qi collapse and yang collapse are similar. They tend to happen together. I think with yang collapse, you're just going to have more cold signs. Technically, there is such a thing as yin collapse. We don't talk about that much. But the point here is Ren Shen is so good at tonifying qi. It's so strong. It so powerfully tonifies qi. We can say that it even tonifies the primal qi or the original tree to rescue collapse or to rescue qi from abandonment. So Ren Shen very powerfully tonifies the qi and it tonifies all the qi. Besides that, I think one thing that people forget is Ren Shen ginseng is very famous for tonifying qi, but people forget that it also has an action of generating fluids and alleviating thirst. So besides tonifying qi, it also has a moistening action as well. So this can be for wasting and thirsting disorder. In Chinese, this is called xiao ke, wasting and thirsting. Sometimes we say it's similar to diabetes, but the idea here is that you're very thirsty, but when you drink in things, you, you're urinating frequently. So you have profuse urination with a lot of thirst and your body is wasting away. And we could say this is similar to uh, diabetes. So wasting and th so by generating fluids, it's helping with uh, the, the thirsting aspect of wasting and thirsting disorder. Or we can say for febrile diseases where both the chi and fluids have been damaged. So if you have an external attack, especially an external attack of wind heat, uh, over a period of time, that external evil can wear down your chi and your chi, your upright chi loses the ability to fight back. Or maybe you took some herbs and you were able to expel the pathogen, but now you feel worn down after that battle with the evil chi. And also if there's some heat there that can dry out the fluids, maybe you had a wind heat attack with a uh, profuse sweating. And so now your fluids are damaged. Ren Shen can help you recover from that because it's powerfully tonifying that chi, but also um, uh, generating body fluids as well. So Ren Shen tonifies both chi and fluids. Uh, the dosage is normal, but sometimes we have this special cooking instruction that we say, cook separately in a double boiler. And I think this is one of the only herbs that we say this about. But kind of the idea here is Ren Shen is very powerful. So if we want the maximum extraction, we're not just going to throw it in a pot and boil it for half an hour like we do with other herbs. We're actually going to put it in a double boiler. And so that will protect it from the extreme heat that we if we have this vigorous fire, it won't it won't get too hot. We put it in a double boiler to protect it. And you might be boiling it for like two or three hours just to get that maximum extraction and doing doing this nice slow heat, you'll really extract it. As far as I know, in, in modern times, I don't know if a lot of people do this anymore. Um, I think even if you're, if you're prescribing this to patients, I feel like telling patients to cook your herbs for half an hour is already a lot, a bit of an ask. If you want to have them go out and buy a double boiler and then cook it for two hours, most modern patients are not going to be compliant with that. But I think this is more especially that if you had some very expensive ginseng that, um, the, the older the ginseng is, the, the, the larger the root, it's considered uh, stronger and it's more expensive. So uh, six-year-old ginseng is much more expensive than two-year-old ginseng. And wild ginseng is much more expensive than cultivated ginseng. So I think if you have this really expensive ginseng and you want to get the most out of it, then yeah, use it in a double boiler. If you're just making a normal formula and you're not necessarily using the high-quality ginseng, 
I'm not sure that people necessarily do that. But that is uh, considered a, a cooking instruction and that does sometimes come up on tests. They'll say, what's the cooking instruction for wrench and you should cook it separately in a double boiler and then add that afterwards into the formula. Uh, the name Ren Chen means man root because um, here for this picture, I this is uh, slices of ginseng root. But when you get the whole thing, it looks kind of like a like a mandrake or a mandragora. If you've watched Harry Potter, that they pull up the roots and it looks like a person. And so this is one that it kind of has a head and uh, little little stringy tails on it. So they say this looks like a person. So they call this person root. Uh, when it comes to ginseng, we have two types. Uh, we have Bai Ren Shen, the white ginseng, and then Hong Shen, the red ginseng. Hong means red, like Hong Hua is red flower, safflower. So Hong means red. And this difference, this isn't a different variety. This is actually just the processing that the white Ren Shen, you just pull it out of the ground and let it dry. The Hong Shen, what they do is they steam it and that steaming process somehow turns it red. I'm not sure if it like caramelizes certain things in it, but it's just that steaming process turns it red. So they steam it and then dry it. And so the, the Hong Shen is a little bit warmer in temperature. So if you especially have, um, you're trying to tonify qi and tonify yang, or if you're trying to tonify qi and you have a lot of signs of coldness, you can use the red ginseng. If you don't necessarily want those warming properties, then you can use the white ginseng by Ren Shen. Um, traditionally, I think Korea is famous for having the best Ren Shen, so we'll say Korean red ginseng. But again, this is something that we have to be careful about taking it long term. That Korean red, red ginseng is very warming, and so that can cause heat to accumulate and cause these heat signs. So, like I said, I had that um, that uh, that student at school that he was taking Korean red ginseng, but he ended up with bloodshot eyes and high blood pressure because even though he was tonifying his chi, you ended up with a lot of heat accumulation as well. So that's something we want to be careful with with using Hongshen in large dosages or for long-term use. So that's Ren Shen. Next, I want to talk about one Xiang Shen, Panacus quinquefolis radix. Xiang Shen is American ginseng. And so this is something, the reason it's in this outlined uh, text is because, at least in Bensky, this is actually put in the category herbs that tonify yin. However, some books will put it in this category herbs that tonify qi, and because it's another type of ginseng, I just wanted to talk about it here. But Xiang Shen is American ginseng. And basically the, the major ways that American ginseng is different from Chinese ginseng is that number one, it's slightly, it's a cold in temperature. Yeah, we say cold in temperature. So uh, white ginseng is warm in temperature. Korean ginseng or red ginseng is even warmer in temperature. American ginseng is cold in temperature. And when it comes to those two, tonifying qi and tonifying yin, xiang shen is much stronger at tonifying yin. So American ginseng still tonifies qi, it's still very good at tonifying qi, but it's much better than ren shen at tonifying yin and generating fluids. So those are the things we should know about American ginseng. And this one, it's kind of interesting because I think in America, we really like, a, Americans want to have that Korean red ginseng. That's considered the high quality ginseng and that's the type of ginseng they want. But I think in China, they actually prefer to have American ginseng, xiang shen. And the reason for that is because it's cold in temperature, because it's more moistening, it's more suitable for long-term use. And so this is something that you could, you could take more long-term without worrying about those heat signs. So I had a Chinese teacher that he would say whenever he went back to visit China, that's one of the things people would always ask him to bring is American ginseng. I think that in cosmetics, like lipstick, apparently they, they had it over there, but it was much more expensive. So when he went over there, he would, uh, we would always take some, some lipstick and some American ginseng to give out as gifts to his, to his friends in his hometown. So it's just kind of interesting that in America, we like the Chinese version. In China, they like the American version. Uh, American ginseng, I believe the best quality is grown in Wisconsin. So I just want to mention that Xiang Shen, but we will see that again uh, in the category herbs at tonify yin, because that's where Bensky puts it. Next is Dong Shen, Codenopsis radix. Dong Shen, Codenopsis radix. And this one is very similar to Ren Shen. We often use it as a substitute for Ren Shen just because 
it's cheaper, but it's also weaker in its actions. So, so for Dongchen, we say it tonifies qi, but for Dongchen, we don't say it tonifies all the qi. We mostly say it tonifies lung qi and tonifies spleen qi or tonifies middle jiao qi. So Dongchen, it doesn't enter the heart channel. It doesn't really tonify heart qi. It's not strong enough to treat qi collapse, but it does have a good action of tonifying lung qi and tonifying spleen qi. And then this is, this is a little bit of a controversial thing that you can say generates body fluids. Some books will say that Dong Shen generates body fluids. Some books will say that it does not. And so like Wiseman and Brand will say that Dong Shen can generate fluids. Um, Bensky, when he talks about comparing this to Xiang Shen and Ren Shen, he specifically says that Dong Shen does not tonify fluids. But I think when we say, when you talk about Dong Shen ton, uh, generating body fluids, we're more saying that it generates fluids indirectly. So let's blow up this, this thing at the bottom here. Um, that there are some books that will say that Dong Shen also tonifies blood and tonifies fluids, but usually when we say this, we mean it's an indirectly tonifying fluids, that it's by a consequence of tonifying the qi that helps with fluid generation and that helps generate blood. So it's it's kind of like however you want to say it that Bensky will say, no, it doesn't generate fluids, but maybe by generating qi it does generate fluids. There are other books that will directly say Dong Shen tonifies uh, blood and, ton and generates fluids, but we should know that it's kind of doing it indirectly. It's definitely not as strong as Ren Shen or Xiang Shen when it comes to that. Bensi says, Dong Chen is often used in conjunction with herbs that release the exterior for exterior attacks with underlying deficiency. Yes, that's true, but honestly, we also see that with Ren Chen. Like an example would be Ren Shen Baidu San as a, as a formula for uh, an exterior attack of wind cold with underlying qi deficiency. So it's like we're simultaneously releasing the exterior, but also supporting the, the qi. So he says this about Dong Chen, but the formula that we learn has Ren Shen, so I'm not sure how important that is. Um, and then in formulas, Dong Shen can be used as a substitute for Ren Shen, usually at double the dosage. So when you get into formula class and you start studying formulas, basically every formula that you see that has Ren Shen as an ingredient, underneath that there will be a footnote that says, uh, in modern practice, Dong Shen is usually substituted for Ren Shen at twice the dosage. And so the reason we do this is that Dong Shen is just so much cheaper than high quality ginseng that even when we use twice as much, it's still typically cheaper than good quality Ren Shen. So that's very common just as like a cost saving measure that we can say Dong Shen is good enough. We don't need to use that expensive ginseng. We just need to double the dosage. So that's kind of the thing here when, when in Bensky he says the dosage is six to nine grams. I think in practice, other books will say no, it's, it's 10 to 20 grams, but in practice, it's gonna be more than that. In practice, it's gonna be double the dosage of ginseng, so it's more into that 10 to 20 gram range, or he says up to 30 grams. So I think it's very unusual that you would see such a small dosage of Dongshen used in formulas. The name Dongshen means group root. Again, Shen means root. Um, and so this one, this is one that you just have to be careful that if you're going into a Chinese store and you're asking for Dong Shen, uh, what I would do is one of the one of the herb shops I went into the it was actually the the people who owned it were actually Vietnamese, but I'd say oh I want Dong Shen and they say they would say are you saying Dan Shen or Dong Shen? And so remember, Don Shen is from the Invigorate Blood category, Salvia Miltio Radix. This is Dong Shen, Codenopsis Radix. And so this one might be one, it's, it's, at least for me, it's very easy to mispronounce. So if you're, if you're going to a, a Chinese herb shop, you might want to take something along with you or write down the characters. So they make, your, make sure you're getting Dong Shen, not Dan Shen. Another one that's uh, kind of used as a substitute for Ren Shen is Tai Zi Shen, Pseudo Stellaria Radix. Tai Zi Shen, Pseudo Stellaria Radix. And this one, 
Again, it's just commonly used as a substitute for Ren Shen that it's weaker in its strength, but it's much cheaper than Ren Shen, so we can use it as a substitute, or we can use it when we don't need the full strength of Ren Shen. If we have mild conditions or uh, uh, we're trying to treat children and we don't need that, that strength of Ren Shen, we can use Taitsa Shen as an alternative. So it tonifies Mil Jiao Qi and tonifies Lung Qi for all those same things we talked about. Um, fatigue, poor appetite, spontaneous sweating. But we should say this one is definitely weaker than Ren Shen. Notice the dosage is much higher than normal, 9 to 30 grams. And we can also say that Taitsa Shen generates body fluids. So we can say, especially for a thirst in the aftermath of a febrile disease, again, like you had a wind heat attack, and so that heat was drying out the fluids, you had a great sweat, so you're losing the fluid, so you end up with fluid deficiency or thirst after, after that wind heat attack, Taitsa Shen can generate the fluids. And then this is going to say, for unrelenting fever or summer heat in children. This is just, kind of a footnote in Bensky. I didn't really see this in any other textbooks, but I went ahead and put this in there because I had somebody who said that they got this question on a test. I don't know if it was like their school test or a board test or what, but they said that this was something that came up on a test and I kind of thought maybe this is the one way you can differentiate tights a shen is that it's for um, a fever or summer heat in children. I think really the way we'd say this is that because Taitsa Shen is much more mild, it's much more suitable to be used with children. And so even the name is Prince Root. Taitsa means uh, prince or Tai means big or great. Z can mean, it can be a noun suffix or it can mean child. So this is like a great child or a prince. And I think kind of here the idea is that like Ren Shen is like a kingly herb. It's the king of herbs. It's in. It's like an emperor when it comes to tonifying qi. It's very strong. It's very powerful. Whereas Taitsa Shen is more like the prince. It's the baby version of Ren Shen. So what we can say about this is um, Taitsa Shen is actually, we usually compare it to Xiang Shen, American ginseng. It's very similar to Xiang Shen in that it tonifies qi and generates fluids. It's neutral in temperature, so it's less likely to cause those heat signs, but it's much weaker in its actions. So it's typically used for mild cases or for children. When we don't need such a kingly herb, we can use the princely herb instead. Or you can think that Taitsa means like prince, and so that's princes are children, so we can use it for children. But just know that the dosage is much larger than average, 9 to 30 grams, just because it has a weaker action. It's weaker in strength, so we need more of it in order for it to work. So those are kind of our, our ginseng herbs that we have. Ren Shen, which tonifies all the qi and rescues qi from collapse, but it's a very expensive herb, so sometimes we use substitutes like Dang Shen or Taitsa Shen. So sometimes I think about those three kind of as a triplet that kind of do the same thing. After that, we get into Huang Qi Astragaly Radix. Huang Qi Astragaly Radix, and this is Astragalus root. I think this has become a more common herb in, in the West that sometimes when you go into natural supplement stores, you can even find Huang Qi as in a pill form because people in the West have caught on to it. So Huang Qi tonifies Lung Qi. Uh, for all those things that we talked about, but we specifically say that Huang Qi has an action of sealing the pores and strengthening the Wei Qi. So there's a couple of ways we can say this. We can say that um, Huang Qi seals the pores and stops sweating. We can say that Huang Qi stabilizes the exterior, or we can say Huang Qi strengthens the Wei Qi, strengthens the defensive Qi. Um, uh, to keep out pathogens. So whatever way we say it, basically we're saying that by tonifying the lung qi, huang qi has a specific action of strengthening the exterior, strengthening the wei qi, and on the one hand, that keeps the sweat in, because like we said, if lung qi is deficient, the, the, the interstices are unsound, and so the sweat can leak out. So by tonifying, the, by stabilizing the exterior, that keeps the sweat in. What that also does by stabilizing the exterior is that keeps the pathogens out. So if we have someone who very easily catches a cold or someone who gets sick very easily uh, with recurrent colds, then we can use Huang Qi to strengthen the exterior so those pathogens can't get in. Um, oh, so here we say for spontaneous sweating and for preventing illness. So by strengthening the exterior, stabilizing the exterior, it keeps the sweat in and it keeps the pathogens out. 
One thing I will say here is I think some people get confused here and like I said, Huang Qi is being used more in the West and people talk about Huang Qi as it's something that boosts the immune system because a lot of times we think about the way Qi is being similar to the immune system. What I will say here is that when it comes to these frequent colds or when it comes to getting sick, the strategies we use in Chinese medicine are very different from this idea of an immune system in Western medicine. So what we're using Huang Qi for is to strengthen the exterior to keep this evil Qi out. But kind of like we said with astringent herbs is that if you're already sick, if you have a cold pathogen, if you have a cold pathogen in your lung, if you have an evil Qi inside your body, if you strengthen the exterior, that's gonna trap the pathogen inside. I mean, think about it. When, 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 we, when we have an exterior attack of wind cold or wind heat, our treatment principle is to promote sweating to release the exterior, promote sweating to push the pathogen out. If you're using Huang Qi, which is an herb that seals the pores and stops sweating, you're not gonna be able to put, push the pathogen out. You're just gonna trap it inside. And so this is something that I think people get confused about. They'll be like, oh, I started to feel a tickle in my throat. I started to feel like something was coming on. So I used Huang Qi to boost my immune system. That is not the strategy we use in Chinese medicine. If you feel some early stage attack, it's better to take some mild uh, diaphoretics like um, ginger, white onion, uh, dondo chur, prepared soybean. It's better to eat some miso soup to mildly promote sweating to push it out rather than strengthen the exterior. So when we say this is for preventing illness, this would be like if you frequently catch colds, then in between those bouts of illness, when you're not feeling any symptoms, then you would take Huang Qi to strengthen the exterior. Don't take Huang Qi when you have an exterior attack that will just trap the pathogen in. So Huang Qi, very, very famous herb for tonifying lung Qi, strengthening the Wei Qi, and sealing the pores to stop sweating. Huang Qi also tonifies spleen Qi for all those things we talked about like indigestion, fatigue, or lethargy, and loose stools. But in tonifying spleen chi, one of the specialties for huang chi astragalus root is it raises the yang chi to counter prolapse. So remember we said at the beginning that the spleen has an upward direction. So if spleen chi is deficient, it will fail in raising the clear chi. It will fail in lifting things up. And what can happen is things will start to sink downward. So we can have things like organ prolapse, uterine prolapse, rectal prolapse, um, Chronic diarrhea could be there's not enough spleen chi lifting upwards. So we could have certain symptoms of uh, deficiency symptoms in the upper body because there's not enough chi moving upward. So Huang Chi has a very famous action of raising the chi to counter prolapse. Remember, we learned some other herbs with this function in the very beginning. We learned uh, Chai Hu and Sheng Ma from the cool acrid herbs that release the exterior category. So remember, Sheng Ma is ascending hemp. It has an upward direction to raise spleen chi. Chai Hu also has an upward direction. It raises both spleen chi and liver chi, which is kind of like a side effect. We usually don't want to raise liver chi. But anyway, these herbs are often combined with Huang Chi. So this is something important to know going forward when you get into formulas. It's also something that is very common to ask on tests. Will there will there be like, what are the three herbs that raise qi to counter prolapse? Well, well, here we have huang qi, a tonifying herb, but then we also have chai hu and sheng ma, which do the same thing. So that's a very important thing to know about huang qi. Huang qi astragalus also promotes urination to treat edema. So this is for edema caused by spleen qi deficiency. So like we said, the, the spleen is supposed to, has something to do with fluids. It's supposed to transform dampness. So if spleen qi is deficient, it no longer transforms this dampness and you end up with edema or generalized puffiness. So Huang Qi not only tonifies the spleen so that it can perform its function of transforming dampness, it also has an action of promoting urination to get rid of the dampness. So this is like taking care of both the root and the branch at the same time. So very convenient herb. And then we also say Huang Qi promotes flesh gener regeneration or generates flesh and closes sores. So we say chronic sores and ulcerations due to deficiency. So these could be like, um, boils or abscesses that fail to close. Um, 
Kind of the idea here is remember that the spleen governs the flesh. And so if spleen chi is deficient, you're, it's just not able to close those sores. You're slower to heal from those sores uh, because your spleen, uh, because your chi is deficient. You just don't have the energy to do it. And this is not necessarily something they say in the books, but the kind of the way I think about this is it's very, this, I feel like this is very common in diabetics, that they might have some ulcers or some sores, especially on the feet. And um, when they get those ulcers, it's very difficult to heal. Or sometimes just, um, especially with older people in certain areas where they don't have very great circulation, like um, it's happened to my dad once he got, a, he banged his ankle and it just took forever to heal. And it's just like, he doesn't have good circulation to begin with, and that area of the body doesn't have good circulation to begin with, that's where I might think of something like using Huang Qi to regenerate flesh. So, and I think technically we say that this is for flesh regeneration due to deficiency. Like you said, if there's not enough Qi to, um, to, pow to fuel that healing process, then we use Huang Qi, but I have had coworkers that just use this for general injury and trauma. Like I think there was one guy that his finger got chopped off when it got caught in a barn door. And so on the one hand, he gave him herbs like Ru Xiang and Mo Yao to regenerate flesh, but he also gave him Huang Qi, and it did a very good job of helping, uh, helping with that. So that might be another, another thing we can think about about promoting flesh regeneration. But Huang Qi, I would majorly think of this as tonifying lung Qi, strength in the exterior, and tonifying spleen Qi for its lifting action. If number three, think about promoting urination to treat edema. Oh, blood. This is, some, this is a note I put in there to remind myself. So this is another weird Bensky thing that if you are strictly following Bensky, or if you have a teacher who very strictly follows Bensky, when Bensky talks about tonifying qi, he will say that Huang Qi tonifies qi and blood. And so this is something that Bensky says. This is something that other books do not say. And so to me, this is kind of thing of like, does Huang Qi actually tonify blood? And in my opinion, the answer is no. Huang Qi does not tonify blood. Huang Qi is there for tonifying qi. And so the example that Bensky uses, he says that it's good for tonifying blood, especially in cases of uh, severe or sudden blood loss, that Huang Qi can help tonify the blood. And when he says this, I'm guessing the only, the, the only thing this could be referring to is Huang Qi does come up in a formula called Dang Wei Bu Shui Tong, Dang Wei Tonify the Blood Decoction. It's a formula for tonifying blood, and it does have a very large dosage of Huang Qi in it. And so... The, the thing here is the, the formula Dangwei Bu Shui Tong, it's not really for generalized blood deficiency or blood deficiency due to your constitution or like, you know, it's like I'm vegetarian and I feel tired after my period. It's not for that kind of blood deficiency. That formula, the way it was explained to me is specifically for blood deficiency that happens after severe blood loss, like injury and trauma, like I cut my leg off with a chainsaw and I had the sudden blood was gushing out and leaving my body all at once. So it turns out when we have that situation of uh, severe blood loss, when blood is leaving the body, we say that the chi leaks out with the blood or the chi is leaving with the blood because blood is the mother of chi and chi is the commander of blood. They tend to go together. So as the blood leaks out, the chi leaks out. And so in that formula, Dang Wei Bu Shui Tong, Huang Chi is there to replenish the chi that was lost with the blood. It's not really, not really accurate to say that Huang Qi tonifies the blood. So at least in, in, in my opinion on this, lo looking, at the, looking at the different sources and looking at the formulas where Huang Qi appears as an ingredient, I would say this is similar to our previous case where we could say that by tonifying Qi, Huang Qi can help with blood generation. And like, like we said the same thing kind of like with Rogue Way, with cinnamon bark, that when we said that Rogue Way encourages the generation of blood, we never say that Rogue Way tonifies blood by itself. But there is this idea that by adding some warmth, adding some yang, that can help with the generation of blood. So I kind of think about Huang Qi in the same way that um, Huang Qi doesn't necessarily tonify blood by itself, but there's kind of this idea that 
The process of creating blood requires energy. That, yes, blood is made up of nutrients and substances that you digest, but actually building, building those, uh, build, putting the building blocks together to generate the blood, that's a process that requires energy. That's a process that requires qi. And so with huang qi, by adding in some huang qi, that can help give us the qi to generate blood. But I think it's, personally, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that Huang Qi tonifies blood directly. But just know that this is something that comes up in Bensky. So if you're following Bensky very strictly, or if you're, uh, if you have a teacher that tonifies, that follows uh, Bensky very strictly, you should know that he says that Huang Qi tonifies Qi and tonifies blood. But I'm not sure we have a lot of examples and formulas to back that up. Uh, the dosage of Huang Qi is larger than average, so a normal dosage is 9 to 15 grams. Uh, Bensky will say we can use up to 30 grams. It turns out when we look at formulas, there are certain formulas where, you, where we use a ridiculously large dosage of Huang Qi, like up to 120 grams of Huang Qi. So it's not unusual to use very large dosages of Huang Qi. So even just the regular dosage is bigger than usual. But sometimes we will use very large dosages when we do want to have a very strong action of tonifying the qi. There are a couple ways we can prepare it that if we want to uh, emphasize its action of tonifying spleen qi and raising yang, that we can prepare it with honey, and that's called mi zhi huang qi. Remember, honey is sweet in flavor. The sweet flavor goes to the middle jiao, so you can think that by preparing this with honey, we're adding in some sweetness we're, to help with its tonifying. We're helping it go to the middle jiao. Also, honey, it, but because of its sweet flavor, it's very moistening, so it can help with moistening dryness. So sometimes huang qi by itself, because it promotes urination and because it's a warm herb, it can very easily dry the person out. So if we uh, stir fry it with some honey, it will give it some of a moistening quality, so we're less likely to dry the person out with long-term use. So that's called mi zhi huang qi, or just zhi huang qi. And this is a very common preparation. At least when I was in school, in our school clinic, we did have a jar of regular huang qi, and right next to it was a jar of zhi huang qi, the honey-prepared version, so it is very common to get. This other one is less common, um, that we can prepare huang qi with alcohol or with wine as well. So normally when we talk about preparing an herb with alcohol, we say that it enhances its ability to invigorate blood or stop pain or go to the liver channel. That's really not what we're doing here. Here we would use the wine prepared version to help the huang qi go to the exterior. So we can think that alcohol floats upwards and outwards. That's why when you drink alcohol, you get a red face because it's sending things upwards. So here we're using that alcohol to send things up and outwards to the surface. So we can use jiu chao huang qi or wine fried or alcohol prepared huang qi in order to emphasize this action of sealing the pores and strengthening the wei qi. This one, I think it's not a very common preparation. I'm not sure that you can or you can order this from herb suppliers the way that you can the mi zhi huang qi. Huang qi, the name means yellow celery, which I think is kind of interesting. And I have heard this, it also goes by the name bei qi. Bei means north, and so um, just because that's where it's cultivated. So um, especially some, I know some Taoist practitioners who would, or some Qigong practitioners who would refer to it as Bei Qi, and that just means Huang Qi, a stragglus root. Next, another important one is Bai Ju, a tractylotus macrocephala rhizoma. Bai Ju, a tractylotus macrocephala rhizoma. This herb tonifies qi, and I would think about this as tonifying spleen qi. So when you see baiju, I would think spleen. So baiju tonifies qi, but it specifically tonifies middle jiao qi, qi tonifies spleen stomach qi, for all those things we talked about, like indigestion, uh, fatigue or lethargy, and loose, loose stools. We do say that uh, baiju similar has an action of stabilizing the exterior and stopping sweating. But this one, at least the things that I've seen, we don't go so far as to say that Baiju tonifies the Wei Qi or tonify or Baiju strengthens the Wei Qi or strengthens the defensive Qi. I think here we're more talking about that 
when spleen chi is deficient, the chi can't hold in the fluid, so it's very easy for, for those fluids to leak out. So it's very similar to Huang Chi, but we just don't go so, so far as to say it strengthens the Wei Chi. We just say it stabilizes the exterior and stops sweating. So this would be more for spontaneous sweating due to spleen chi deficiency. But we will use those two herbs together, Huang Chi and Baiju, for this action of stopping sweating. Baiju also dries dampness. So this is similar to Huang Qi, is, except that um, with Huang Qi, we specifically said it drains dampness, as in it promotes urination to get rid of the dampness. Here we say that Baiju dries dampness. So it's not promoting urination. Notice it has a bitter flavor, and that bitter flavor is drying out the dampness. So the result is very similar. We're using it for edema due to spleen qi deficiency, but just a very kind of small detail is Huang Qi drains dampness, Baiju dries dampness. Um, but again, this, but this is very convenient because spleen qi deficiency often presents with dampness. So again, it's like we're dealing with uh, the root cause and the branch symptom at the same time. That if we have dampness due to spleen qi deficiency, it's tonifying the spleen and drying the dampness at the same time. Baiju is one, also one of our herbs that calms restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. So when we say restless fetus here, we're talking about, we're usually talking about excessive movement or excessive kicking of the fetus. And there our concern is that this excessive movement or excessive kicking may lead to a miscarriage. Uh, sometimes when we talk about restless fetus, we can also talk about bleeding during pregnancy, which is also a concern. Or we can even talk about uh, using this for uh, habitual miscarriage. That if we have a patient that we know that they have a history that they've been able to get pregnant, but then they, it ends in a miscarriage that we can maybe use this preventive, preventatively to um, prevent a miscarriage, and we call that habitual miscarriage. So um, we've learned a couple like this. Baiju, we would say it tonifies uh, spleen chi to calm restless fetus, so for restless fetus due to spleen chi deficiency. Uh, we learned other herbs like sha ren, cardamom, is for that middle jiao chi stagnation. Similar, Zutsuye, some people say that Zutsuye calms restless fetus by regulating middle jiao qi. But then we had other herbs like Huang Qin clears heat uh, to calm restless fetus. So we've learned a few herbs so far with this function of calming restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. Baiju is one of them. So Baiju, um, the dosage is a little bit larger than average, but then just notice that it enters both the spleen and stomach channels, and those are the only ones. So that's why I'd say I would, uh, when you see Baiju, think more about the middle jowl and the spleen stomach, not necessarily tonifying lung qi or anything like that. It's both bitter and sweet. It's sweet because it tonifies. It's bitter because it dries dampness in the middle jowl. So that's Baiju, attract lotus macrocephaly rhizoma. After that is Gan Sao Glycerizi Radix. Gan Sao Glycerizi Radix. This is licorice root. So Gan Sao has a lot of functions. All of them are important. Gan Sao tonifies uh, qi, and we here we say it specifically tonifies heart qi and spleen qi. So Gan Sao licorice root does have a very famous action of tonifying spleen qi. It's very commonly used for spleen qi deficiency. But I just like to emphasize that this is one of the few herbs in this category that also tonifies heart chi as well. So, so far, these are the only two herbs with this function, uh, Ren Shen and Gan Sao, that tonify heart chi, treating things like certain Shen problems like irritability, restlessness, insomnia, but also palpitations and an irregular pulse. So uh, Huang, Gan Sao enters the heart channel, so I think it's important to remember that Gan Sao tonifies spleen chi and heart chi as well. Gan Sao moistens the lung and stops cough. And because Gan Sao is neutral in temperature, we can use it for both heat patterns and cold patterns of cough. But here I think the idea is we're talking about that weak cough due to deficiency because this is a sweet herb that tonifies. Um, so I have used this before. Uh, one time I had a friend that she had, she had gone to China, to Beijing for like a month. And when she went there, the, like, the pollution was very bad. So she ended up with some respiratory problems when she came back to America. She just had this, this chronic dry cough that was just kind of like, she was always clearing her throat, like, <clears throat> just kind of like, kind of those annoying people who are like, like just are constantly coughing. And you're like, do you need a cough drop, Dolores? Um, 
And so this is this is something that I actually just had like a jar of Gonsal that was it had been there for a while. It was starting to go bad, and I wanted to get rid of it. So I was like, "Hey, do you want to try this Gonsal?" So I like just took like a hundred or hundred and fifty grams of Gonsal and cooked it and said, "Here, drink this." And I tried some of it, and it was really sweet. It reminded me of like a, a sugary cereal. Like she almost couldn't drink it because it was sweet. And so um, uh, it was like too. It was sickly sweet. It was hard to drink, but. Like three days later, she was like, oh, yeah, my cough is totally gone. It had been, it was this lingering cough that had been there for a month or two. And she, uh, she took some gonsao and it moistened her lung and stopped the cough. So that's an example of using gonsao for that action. We also say gonsao relieves spasm and pain. And here we're particularly talking about uh, pain, spasm, and cramping of the abdomen or cramping of the legs, specifically cramping of the calves. And this is a very interesting function, and it turns out we pretty much only use this function when gansao is being combined with another herb, bai shao white peony, which we'll learn later in the tonify blood category. So I think bai shao has the most famous action of uh, relieving cramping, spasm, and pain, especially in the abdomen and legs, but we sometimes combine it with gansao, so we say gansao does have this action, but it pretty much only comes up in combination with bai shao. Gansao also clears heat toxicity, and this is one I like to emphasize just because when I was in school, I was a TA for an herb teacher, and he always liked to ask this question, and he would always point this out, that everybody remembers that Gansao tonifies spleen chi, but they forget that Gansao also clears heat toxicity as well. It's neutral in temperature, so it does have this heat clearing action, so for carbuncles, sores, and sore throats, we will see some formulas where Gansao is there to clear heat toxicity. And then probably the most common usage of gansao is we say it moderates and harmonizes the other herbs in a formula. So notice when we look at the channels here, we kind of specifically say it enters the heart, lung, spleen, stomach channels because it tonifies the chi of the heart and spleen. It also moistens the lungs, so it definitely enters those channels. But this is one that some sources will say that gansao enters all 12 channels. And that makes it very good for this action of moderating and harmonizing the other herbs. So what do we mean by this action of moderates and harmonizes the other herbs? Well, on the one thing, when on the one hand, when we say moderates, we're talking about moderating the harshness of certain herbs. So there are certain herbs that they're they're very cold in nature. They're very harshly cold, and they can very easily damage the spleen. Like think about like a uh, sure gao. Uh, gypsum fibrosum, a very cold herb. We use it in the formula Bai Hu Tong to clear that heat with the four bigs. But our worry is that very cold herb could very easily damage the spleen. So in that formula, we add in some Gansao licorice root to sort of moderate that harshness. It protects the spleen from the cold properties of those herbs. We could also say Gansao, because it tonifies spleen, it helps with the digestion of those herbs. We also see this come up when we're talking about harshness as in toxicity, that certain herbs are toxic in nature, and so Gansao can moderate some of that toxicity. You might have remember, we, we talked about this before, when we talk about the preparations of herbs like Ban Sha, uh, Penelia rhizoma, and Futsa, Aconite, that both of these are toxic in their raw form. One way we can reduce their toxicity is to stir fry them with ginger, and that ginger reduces their toxicity. But if you remember, there's a second way is by boiling it with gansao, licorice root, uh, moderates that toxicity. So when we talk about ban sha, we can talk about jiang ban sha is prepared with ginger, but fa ban sha is prepared with gansao. And I want to say also like black bean. Same thing with futsa. We can have jur futsa that's prepared with um, ginger, I think is the most common one. But we also have a preparation where we boil futsa with gan sao to reduce its toxicity. So that's what we mean by moderates. And then we also say harmonizes the other herbs. What do we mean by harmonizing? This is something I'm kind of making up, but this is the way I think about it is... Remember we said that Gansao goes to all 12 channels. So Gansao is commonly used as an 
envoy in formulas, that it's not there to treat the main action of the formula, but it's there to direct the herbs to the different parts of the body. So that because Gonzo enters all 12 channels, that makes it a very suitable herb for making sure the herbs get to the places that they need to go. So at least the way I think about it when we say harmonizes the other herbs is that sometimes we have a formula where we're mixing together very different herbs, especially if we're dealing with a complex pattern. Maybe we have a combination of excess and deficiency. We have a, co a combination of heat and cold in different parts of the body. It's just that when we have those very different actions of the herbs, Gansau can be there to make sure that all the herbs go to where they need to go. And so that if you have some herbs that are directed towards the upper body, some herbs are directed towards the lower body, some herbs are about clearing heat, some herbs are about warming cold, Gansau is there just to make sure that everybody gets to where they need to go instead of having it just turn into a, a lukewarm warm formula. So that's kind of what I think about when we use the term harmonizing, but we all will also say that it moderates the harshness of herbs, either their harsh cold properties or their toxic properties, or we can say that a small amount of Gansau is there to help digestion so that we can actually digest the herbs and make use of their properties. We have things like minerals, especially, are very hard to digest. So it could be helpful to have some Gansau there to help with digestion. So basically when you get to formula class, it's like three quarters of our formulas at the very end, it's gonna say add three grams of Gansau and it's there to harmonize the properties of the other herbs. So that's an action of Gansau. Uh, similar to before, we can say that if we want to enhance Gansau's ability to tonify chi, tonify spleen chi, we can stir fry it in honey and then it becomes chur Gansau. And so on the one hand, uh, honey is sweet in flavor, so this enhances its ability to tonify, but also stir frying it in honey makes it warmer in temperature. So instead of being neutral in temperature, it becomes warm in temperature. So if we're trying to tonify spleen chi, it could be very good to use the honey prepared version, Jurgan Sao. But if we're trying to clear heat toxicity, it's probably better to use the raw form of Gan Sao since it's neutral in temperature. So that's Gan Sao licorice root. The name actually means sweet herb. Gan means sweet, like the five flavors, and Sao means herb or grass. So Gan Sao is sweet herb. There's actually kind of a funny story here um, that I once read in a book that had had little stories or anecdotes about all the herbs. And one of them was about Gansa, where uh, there was this guy who owned an herb shop, but he was going away on a trip. He might have been going up into the mountains to collect more herbs. So he's going to be gone for a long time. And it turns out he got delayed. There was like a snowstorm or something. So he was planning on being gone for a week, but he ended up being gone for like a month. But anyway, before he left, he was closing up his herb shop and he, he told his wife, uh, take care of the herb shop, but don't touch anything. Don't do anything while I'm gone. Uh, just keep things where they are. I'll be back soon. Turns out he ended up being gone for a long time and all these people started coming and knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm sick. I need to take herbs. And, and the wife was like, well, my husband said, I don't really know anything about herbs. My husband said not to touch anything. Let's just wait until he gets back. But Days and days went by, people kept coming and saying, I'm, I'm sick, I need herbs. And so she's, she decided she had to do something to help these people. Now, she didn't know anything about herbs. So, um, but in her mind, what she figured, what seemed logical is people would want to, people would want to take herbs that taste good. It's good for business if you have herbs that taste good. So she went she went through and tasted all the herbs. Some of the herbs were very spicy, some of the herbs were very bitter, some of the herbs were very sour and she didn't like them. But then she came across one herb that was very sweet. It had a very pleasant flavor and she thought, well, this is a nice herb. Surely people would want to drink this herb. And so basically anybody who came to the door and wanted herbs, she said, oh, well, here, here's some of this herb. It's a very sweet and very nice tasting herb. Take this one. And so what happened was the, eventually the husband got back and he saw what was going on. He saw that all these people were coming in and she was just randomly giving them Gansau without any, any knowledge of herbs or any knowledge of diagnosis. And he was like, oh no, I'm ruined. You've ruined my business. You're, you, these people won't get better because he didn't give them the correct herbs. No, nobody's going to come back to this, this herb shop anymore. And it, it turns out what actually happened is like, all of those patients got better. Like everyone who came to see her, their symptoms improved. And um, so actually everyone was like, oh, this is so much better than normal that normally I get these, these terrible tasting herbs that, you know, this is so much better that I'm taking nice tasting herbs and I'm actually seeing more improvement. And so I think kind of the idea of that story is that 
because Gonzao enters all 12 channels, because it has this harmonizing effect that we can, it can be used for a lot of different things. And I, so I think that's kind of the point of that story is that it, uh, because it enters all 12 channels, it has a very wide range of use and it's kind of like it can help everything. So it's, I feel like sometimes acupuncturists are like, they use four gates for everything. Like whatever comes in, they're like, oh, let's give them four gates and maybe they'll get better. This is kind of the same thing where like, oh, let's give them Gonzao and maybe they'll get better. And maybe the reason for that is because it enters all 12 channels. But I guess the other thing we could say about this is sometimes what people will say about Gonzao is that it has a lot of different actions. It can enter all 12 channels and it has a wide range of actions, but it, it's not particularly good at any single action. And so we could say it's like a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And so that's why it's just very common to use it Every formula we'll see, you see has like three grams of gonzo at the end. So that's a very common thing. I would say that one of its specialties we should point out is that it does tonify heart chi as well. That does come up in one formula that we'll mention later. So that's gonzo, licorice root. Sorry, that was kind of a long explanation for just that one herb. I think the rest of these will go a little bit quicker. Shan Yao is Chinese yam, Dioscoria rhizoma. Shan Yao Dioscoria rhizoma, and this is mountain yam or Chinese yam. So Shan Yao tonifies middle jiao chi for all those things we talked about, like uh, fatigue, spontaneous sweating, and loose stools or diarrhea. Shan Yao also tonifies lung chi and lung yin for chronic cough and wheezing due to deficiency. So this is very common with the lung that we could have lung chi deficiency and lung yin deficiency at the same time that we have chi deficiency and dryness. So for a chronic dry cough, we can use Shan Yao because it both tonifies lung chi and lung yin. And for Shan Yao, we say it's Chinese yam, but this is not like a yam or a sweet potato that you would get in America. If you, if you go to a Chinese uh, supermarket, they do have Shan Yao there, and it's like a very long root. It's like a long cylinder tube thing. And if you cut into it, it's very juicy. It's very moist. Like when you cut into it, it'll be like kind of wet and sticky. And this is something that even if you look at your herb sample, that one, it's very brittle. It's like a potato chip. It's easy to snap in half, but it's also kind of chalky on the outside. So you can tell that in its raw form, it was, it was very moist. It was very juicy. But then when you, then when it got dried out, that turned into a chalkiness. So it has this chalky quality to it. But basically because Shan Yao is so moist and juicy, we can say it has this action of tonifying lung yin and helping with dryness. Then we also say it tonifies kidney and secures essence. So what this is for when you say secures essence, this is what we were talking about with those leakage things. So for kidney related leakage, such as frequent urination, seminal emission, and vaginal discharge, that um, we're, we're tonifying kidney and holding things in. And so that's what another thing that Shan Yao is used for. We can also say it's for wasting and thirsting disorder, Xiao Ke. Again, this is a person has like almost unquenchable thirst, but they have, whenever they drink something, they just have very frequent urination. So Shan Yao is a very good herb for that because on the one hand, it goes to the lung. It tonifies lung qi and tonifies lung yin, and that takes care of the symptoms of thirst, but then it also secures kidney essence. So it helps with that um, frequent profuse urination. So Shan Yao is uh, taking care of that Xiao Ke from both ends. And I just like to emphasize this one um, again because Shan Yao is, is very famous. Most people remember that Shan Yao is yam and it's good for the middle jiao. It's good for tonifying spleen qi. Often people forget that it can also have this mild action of tonifying the kidney and securing essence. So later, we'll, when you get to formula class, we talk about a very famous formula for tonifying the kidneys, Shen Qi Wan, kidney qi pill, or it's also called Jingwei Shen Qi Wan because it comes from the Jingwei Yalue. And it's a formula for kidney yang deficiency plus leakage. And so in that formula, Shan Yao appears. And so I've seen some people try to explain this by saying like, oh, Shan Yao is there because it tonifies the spleen and that will help the kidney because of earth and water or something like that. I think they're actually forgetting that Shan Yao does have an action of tonifying the kidney and Shan Yao has an action of holding things in to stop this leakage. So I think that's a, another important thing that we will see Shan Yao come up in this very famous formula 
for treating these uh, kidney-related leakage problems. So that's what I would remember about Shanyao is that tonifies the spleen, tonifies the lung, and also secures kidney essence. This is a uh, Chinese yam. It's like a food thing. So be food just tends to have a larger dosage. It tends to be more mild. So we need a larger dosage in order for it to work. So in decoction, we would use nine to 30 grams, but then we could also use this in food therapy. We could use this in like soups and congees as something to tonify the middle jowl, especially, but also tonify the lung and secure kidney essence. Enters the spleen, lung, and kidney channels because it tonifies the spleen, tonifies the lung, and tonifies the kidney. The name means mountain herb, or yao means like, we say this is herb, this is the thing that we would translate as medicinal. So it, it just means a, a medicinal thing that can include like minerals and seeds and things like that, but we often translate it as herb. So shan yao is mountain herb or mountain medicinal. And for that is da zao jujube fructus. Da zao jujube fructus. This is Chinese date or jujube. So da zao tonifies spleen qi for all of those things that we've talked about so far. Da zao also has an action of tonifying blood to calm shen. So this is for things like anxiety, depression, and heart palpitation because there's not enough blood nourishing the heart. When there's not enough blood uh, nourishing the heart, the heart can't properly house the shen. And so we end up with certain shen disturbances, especially emotion for this, for dots out, emotional things like anxiety and depression. And so this one, technically in terms of the entering channels, we don't say it enters the heart channel. Technically we don't say it tonifies heart chi the same way that we, it, um, we say that with Ren Shen and with Gan Sao, enter, they enter the heart channel and they tonify heart qi. But we do say this tonifies blood to calm Shen. And this is especially when it's related to some spleen problems as well, is that sometimes a person that if you're, think about the emotions of the spleen. The emotions are like worry and overthinking and pensiveness. So if you have someone who worries a lot, they're overthinking, um, they're very, you can think about students who study a lot or people who just worry about things that were happening. That worry can damage the spleen and once it damages the spleen, that can uh, affect the heart's ability to get blood. And so when we say, when we say calming Shen, we're talking about this kind of dual pattern of spleen qi deficiency and heart blood deficiency is when it's especially useful, when it's kind of the anxiety and depression and restlessness of the heart, but the kind of the worry and overthinking of the spleen as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we mean when we say tonify blood to calm Shen, and it's kind of specifically related to the spleen. We also say it moderates and harmonizes other herbs, same as Gan Sao. Um, a lot of times, like you said, with there's a lot of formulas that you'll have this list of ingredients, and then at the very end, it will say add three grams of Gan Sao, Sheng Jiang, and Da Sao, of licorice, ginger and Chinese date that they all help with the spleen to help digest the herbs and they also harmonize the herbs. Uh, the other reason we say it this way is remember in the beginning we talked about the 18 incompatible herbs and there are certain herbs that are incompatible with Gan Sao, especially our harsh expellents. And so that it turns out there is one formula that I don't think we, I don't think it's on our NCCOM list, but there is one formula that it's using those harsh expellents. And so those harsh expellents are very harsh. We want something to moderate the harshness, but it turns out that we can't use Gansau because Gansau is incompatible with those harsh expellents. So instead we use Datsau. So sometimes people will say, that's why Datsau has this, form, this action of moderating or harmonizing herbs. It's because there is this one specific situation where we would prefer to use Gansau to harmonize the herbs, but we can't because of the 18 incompatibilities. So we turn to dots out instead. And that, and that um, comes up in one formula. It's called like 10 date decoction that you specifically add 10 pieces of dots out to harmonize or moderate those harsh expellents. So that's Datsao, I think of uh, tonify spleen qi, tonifies blood to calm shen. It's red in color, so maybe you can think that the red color has something to do with the heart and the blood, but then it also has this moderating action similar to Gansao. Um, this one, the dosage, 
sometimes we say like 10 to 30 grams. Traditionally, the dosage was not in grams. It was in pieces of Dotsau. So you'd add like five pieces of Dotsau or add in five dates of Dotsau. Uh, the problem with that is uh, in, in modern clinics, uh, they do all their inventory based on grams or they do their pricing based on grams. And so like when, when I was in school, we would be like, uh, like a gram of Dotsau cost five cents or something like that. So you couldn't just say three pieces of Dotsau. If you use three pieces, you still had to weigh it out and put how many grams you used just so that you could uh, bill it correctly and do your inventory correctly because we're also buying it by the pound or by the half kilo. So um, so that's just a thing. Traditionally, they would always say like, add five pieces of Dotsau, but uh, in modern times, you probably have to weigh it out. So you might use a weight measurement instead. Or if you're using like... Um, granules you're you're going to want to use a weight measurement instead and also this can be used in food therapy especially in like congees and things like that it's a little bit sweet so i wouldn't I'm not sure i would add it to soup or anything like that but if you're making a, a congee or a porridge for breakfast you can maybe add some dots out um, to help tonify and make it a little bit sweeter the name dots out just means big date da means big zao means date but specifically referring to this, um, this species of Chinese date. So I think sometimes people get confused here and they'll say, oh, we should use dates in food therapy. And they go to the grocery store and they buy medjool dates or whatever dates they have there. And that's, I don't think it's quite the same thing as um, this Dotsau Chinese date. Doesn't, doesn't quite have the same properties. And also with this one, there are two varieties. There's a red date and the black date. So we can say Hong Zhao or Hong Da Zhao for red date. Again, Hong means red, like Hong Hua is red flower. Hei Zhao or Hei Da Zhao is black date. Hei means black or dark. Thinking if we've learned any Hei's so far. Later we learn Hei Jerma, which is black sesame. I'm not sure we have learned any other Hei. Uh, herb so far, but hates out is black date. And it turns out these are not different varieties of dates. Again, this is like the hates out is, um, uh, it's a preparation. They, they, uh, smoked it and that turns it black. And so it's, it's really hard to pin down what the difference is that I've heard different people say different things. I've heard different books say different things about what the difference between Hong Zhao and Hei Zhao is. This is just one that I've heard that Hong Zhao, because it's red, it goes to the heart, whereas Hei Zhao, because it's black, it helps with the kidneys. I've heard some people say that one is better for, um, one is better for tonifying heart blood to calm Shen, where the black one is better for tonifying spleen qi. I've heard some people just say that for some reason, Hong Zhao is more popular in China and Hei Zhao is more popular in uh, in America. So this is something that, at least when I was in clinic, we we had both versions. Or I think at one time we had both versions and then one time I walked in the herb room and we had two jars. One was labeled Da Zhao and one was labeled um, Hong Zhao and they were, they were the same thing. I think they just bought them from different suppliers, but they were both red. So I was like, you guys know that this is, this is, these are both red dates. Anyway. Um, you can get both of them, but it's just, I'm not entirely sure what the difference is and you might hear different things from different people. So I'm not sure the difference is really huge. What I would say is that if you want your formula to taste good, so like if you're using this in food therapy, I would definitely use the Hongzhao, the red date. Or there's a very famous formula that we use for the for those symptoms of anxiety and depression called Gan Mai Da Tao Tang. We sometimes call this happy tea. It's for like melancholy and depression. It has licorice root and Da Tao. If you're gonna make that and you want it to taste good, use the red date. Uh, Cause I've done this with the black date and it tastes very smoky. It just ruins the taste of everything. So if you, if you use the red date, it will have this nice fruity flavor. If you use the black date, it tastes bad. So I'd say for that reason, just use the red date. Uh, unless, you're, unless you're cooking in, in a decoction where it's gonna taste bad anyway and you specifically want the, 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 the black date. But again, I'm not sure how much of a difference there is. But that's Datsao Jujube Fructus or Chinese date. After that is Bai Bian Do Lab Lab Semen Album. Bai Bian Do Lab Lab Semen Album. Remember, Bai means white, so this is a white bean, or in Latin, Album means white, like Albus Dumbledore was a white wizard. This is hyacinth bean. 
So by being dough for this one, I would think about spleen chi deficiency with dampness and diarrhea. So by being dough tonifies spleen chi, it transforms dampness and it's good for diarrhea. So here we say tonifies spleen chi and specifically transforms dampness for diarrhea and reduced appetite due to spleen deficiency. Um, Bensky will also say for vaginal discharge due to spleen chi deficiency. So this is another form of dampness due to spleen deficiency that the spleen is failing in its function to transform dampness. So we end up with dampness either coming out in the stools or uh, coming out as vaginal discharge. But I would say that in most applications, I think by Biendo, I see it mostly used for diarrhea. So if you remember one of those things, if you have limited room in your head, I would think about diarrhea. Bibiendo also clears summer heat. Remember, summer heat often has an element of dampness to it. So Bibiendo, especially for a summer heat dampness with vomiting and diarrhea. So in both of those, both of these cases, whether we're talking about spleen chi deficiency or whether we're talking about summer heat, the main thing I would focus on here is dampness and diarrhea. So this is another herb that's good for summer heat. I think we've learned a few so far. We learned a uh, shi gua watermelon in the drain fire category. We learned herbs like he ye and lu do, uh, lotus leaf and mung bean. So do, that's another bean. Lu do is green bean or mung bean. We learned ching hao, um, artemisia in the deficiency heat category. So we've learned a few herbs that treat summer heat. Here we have another one, bai bian do, clears summer heat. But again, I would think about dampness and diarrhea. This one can also be used in food therapy because it's a bean. Um, so you can put it in soups, stews, or chilies. The dosage is higher than average because this is a food. Just whenever we have things that are foods, the dosage tends to be higher because we need a larger amount. And then, um, like we said, this is hyacinth bean. And so uh, we can actually use a prepared version of it called chow by bian do. And that's where we just dry fry it a little bit. Um, but the thing about beans is, I was going to say hopefully this, this is obvious, but I'm not sure that everybody knows this, is that with any kind of bean, you're supposed to cook it, that you, that you shouldn't eat it raw. So they say the same thing about like kidney beans and adzuki beans. I'm not sure very many people eat those beans, like get them raw anymore. Most people get them in a can when they've already been cooked. But if you just get like the dried bean and just soak it in water, there's some toxic alkaloids in there that they need to be exposed to heat to, to destroy those toxic alkaloids. So I think you don't even have to boil it. I think it just has to be warmed up to like 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But that's kind of a thing that beans should be cooked. So you should think about that with by Biendo that if you're cooking it in a decoction or you're making it in a soup, it's no problem. You've already applied that heat to destroy those alkaloids, so it's no problem. I think the only issue would be is like if you're grinding it into a powder, that might that might pose a problem. So if you're grinding it into a powder, you should probably get the chow version that it's had some heat applied to it, which will destroy those alkaloids. So you can use chow uh, chow by bian do, especially if you want to make it a little bit warmer and tonify the spleen. But that's by bian do. It means white flat bean. And think about spleen chi deficiency with dampness and diarrhea. Next is huang jing polygonati rhizoma. Huang jing polygonati rhizoma, and this is Siberian's uh, Siberian Solomon seal. So. Some people will just say Solomon seal. It turns out we learn we actually learn two different herbs that are the different varieties of Solomon seal. So Huangjing and Yuju are both Solomon seal. This one is specifically Siberian Solomon's seal. And so Huangjing, it tonifies qi, mostly for middle jiao qi and lung qi, for all those things we talked about. It generates body fluids for lung and stomach yin deficiency. So think about like dryness and thirst. And then it tonifies kidney yin and tonifies essence, but it's very mild in this action. I think this is one where um, I think Bensky says like augments essence or tonifies essence, but other books will say tonifies kidney yin. Kidney yin and essence kind of go together. So I just said tonify yin and essence. And actually with this one, I, I think I, I split it up differently. I think, uh, I think in Bensky he'll say tonifies lung chi and lung yin, and then I'll say tonifies spleen chi and stomach yin. Uh, the way I learned it, we just broke it up differently. We say it tonifies chi, so for lung chi and for spleen chi. 
It generates body fluids. When we say lung and stomach yin, we're talking about generating fluids for thirst and dryness. So that's what Huang Jing is there. And that mildly tonifies the kidney. Actually, there are some books that will put this in the category herbs that tonify yin. And so that's probably important to know that Huang Jing, it's like a, if you have your sample, it's like a thick, sticky black root. It kind of looks like a, a shengdi. It has kind of the same black root, sticky black root texture. So maybe that can help you think that it um, tonifies yin. Uh, maybe the fact that um, it looks like shengdi or shudi, that can help you remember it tonifies the kidney and tonifies essence. Or that it's the name Huang Jing means yellow essence. So yellow means the spleen, essence means the kidney. So it tonifies the middle jowl and tonifies the kidney. But I would say this is not, I'm not sure this is a very commonly used herb. So I, I would remember tonifies spleen qi, lung qi, tonifies uh, yin to generate fluids, but it's not a super commonly used herb. And we do say this one, especially it's very sticky and cloying. So it very easily causes stagnation. So we definitely want to combine it things like uh, Chen Pi, Mu Xiang, Sha Ren to help with digestion, but I'm not sure this is a super commonly herb. Um, kind of our last one is Yi Tang Maltosum. Yi Tang Maltosum. And this is malt sugar or maltose. So this is a type of sugar. So apparently when we talk about sugar, uh, we're, we're talking about disaccharides. So, um, the, the normal sugar we use, like table sugar or the white sugar you have, that is sucrose. And so it, it consists of uh, two parts, one glucose and one fructose. We talk about the sugar in milk that's called lactose that has one glucose and one galactose uh, monosaccharide. Maltose is a different type of sugar that is a disaccharide that it has a glucose plus a glucose put together. So I think it's not as sweet. I think fructose is sweeter than glucose. So it's not as sweet as the, sh the table sugar that we usually use, but it is like a sugar. And I don't have a picture here. You probably don't have a sample of it, but it often comes, it looks kind of like a syrup. It looks kind of like um, uh, amber corn syrup is, um, is what it looks like, not necessarily a, a powder like table sugar. Anyway, etong is sugar, it tonifies middle jiao qi. So etong is sugar, it's sweet in flavor, the sweet flavor goes to the middle jiao, the sweet flavor tonifies and moistens, so that's what etong does, it tonifies and moistens. What I would pay attention to here is etong is, is especially for pain due to middle jiao deficiency. We can say middle jiao qi deficiency or deficiency cold in the middle jiao. And basically we have two or maybe three formulas where this comes up. And in all these cases, uh, etong is being used for abdominal pain due to cold in the middle jowl. So that's what I'd remember about etong is it tonifies middle jowl to stop pain. It also nourishes lung for dry cough. Um, so this one, the dosage is larger than average because it's kind of, it's like a food, but we also say this one, uh, you just stir it in at the end. It, again, if you see this, it's kind of like a syrup, like a corn syrup or a honey. So you wouldn't cook it in a decoction. If you try to put it in uh, with the other herbs, it would either stick to the herbs or it would sink to the bottom and burn on the bottom of the pot. So what you do is you would cook your other herbs like normal, strain the decoction, and then this, just stir this in at the end. It's like stirring in honey to your tea. So that's kind of our special cooking instruction for etong. And again, this, this comes up in like two formulas and it's specifically for abdominal pain due to middle jowl deficiency. So that's what I remember about Yi Tong. So at least when I was in school, that's where we ended. That was the last of our syllabus, but I'll, I'll just put in two more for giggles. Um, one is uh, Feng Mi, uh, Mel, that sounds kind of funny, Feng Mi. Uh, Feng Mi, Mel is honey. And I just like to put this one on here because um, it's very, it's kind of similar to etong honey. It's like a liquid sugar. You don't cook it. You put it in at the end. And, um, and this does sometimes come up in formulas that either will prepare herbs with honey or we'll use honey as a binding agent. If we want to make pills, we'll stir things together with honey to make pills. Or sometimes it's just added into the formula or sometimes we can use it in food therapy. So I just wanna mention it briefly because you may actually uh, give it to your patients as food therapy. 
Some books will put it in this category, Herbs That Tonify Qi, because it tonifies middle jiao qi, kind of like Yitong, it like relaxes tension and relieves pain. So it's tonifying middle jiao because it's sweet in flavor. Some books will put this, actually put this in the moist laxative category because Yitong moistens the large intestine to treat constipation due to dryness. And so some books will put this in the same category as like Huoma Ren and Yili Ren to treat constipation. So I just like to bring this up because this is something that you might prescribe in food therapy that say a person has a lot of uh, spleen qi deficiency, maybe you'll, most people don't want to cook congees. I would say don't prescribe rice congees, but maybe that you instead would have a porridge like oatmeal that it's very similar. It's very easy to digest. It has a little bit of bitterness to it to help with dampness, but it's easier to cook than congee. And so maybe you would want to add some of these other things to this oatmeal, like hongzhao, red dates, or honey to help tonify the spleen. You could also use this if you, if you want something natural for to treat constipation, that you could take honey because it's a, it's a moist laxative, and we could combine it with other seeds and nuts that are very oily. So you could make, a, make an oatmeal and you could add in some uh, walnut, he tao ren, which is very oily and moistens large intestine. You can add in hadrama, black sesame, which is very oily and moistens large intestine. And then you can add in some honey. And then you have like this combination of herbs that moisten the large intestine. Plus you have the fiber of the oatmeal. So if you have someone who has this chronic constipation and you don't want to give them an herbal formula, that's a possibility you can use. Um, I also have a video on the YouTube channel about black sesame balls where it's it's, it's those ingredients, black sesame, hadrama, walnut, he tao ren, and honey to bind it together into a little ball. And that's a, it's tonifying yin and yang, but it's also moistening the large intestine. So that's why I like to bring this one up because you may want to tell your patients about this if they have constipation or spleen qi deficiency. Just remember that because it's moistening, uh, be careful in, with loose stools. So it's very common with people with spleen qi deficiency that have dampness and loose stools. So in that case, using honey would be inappropriate. We can say honey can very easily create dampness. So if you have these damp conditions, like the person is puffy, they have edema, they have loose stools or diarrhea, this would not be um, a, a, a situation where you'd use this. I'd kind of say sometimes when you have spleen qi deficiency, you have people with spleen qi deficiency, but they, they tend to be a little doughy, a little puffy, a little bit overweight. Those people have a little bit more dampness. You might not want to give them honey, but sometimes you get people with spleen qi deficiency as in they're very thin and they just don't have a very strong appetite. And so then they sometimes also have dry stools to go along with it. So I think that might be a case where you might want to add honey or even add honey to the formula for that spleen qi deficiency, but they have, um, they have, uh, they're, they're thin. They don't have a lot of flesh. They don't have these problems with dampness. Honey might help. Uh, add some sweetness and it might improve their appetite as well. So um, they can eat more and um, say the spleen governs flesh. It's like they, it's like, I don't want to say they're wasting away, but sometimes because they have poor appetite, they end up being very thin and have difficulty putting on weight. And sometimes I've had this with fertility patients sometimes too. So that's something you think about for fung mi honey. And then the other one, this is kind of annoying. Uh, jing mi or gung mi, this is rice, specifically non-glutinous rice. And I put this in here on the one hand, sometimes people like to prescribe kanjis, um, but really I put this in here because it turns out this is on the NCCOM herb list, that they put this in there on their herb list. And it's actually not in, like it's not in a textbook. I had to like just get this information off the internet because I couldn't find it in any of my textbooks and I own three Materia Medicas and it's not in there, but it's still on the NCCOM list. But it turns out this will come up in one or two formulas that we learn specifically by Hutong white tiger decoction. It puts uh, rice in there. And sometimes when we talk about guajir tong, it'll say after you take the guajir tong, eat some rice kanji. So it's, it's worth talking about. Say uh, jing mi or gung mi, the, the, the Chinese character is the same, but I believe it can be pronounced two different ways. So sometimes in pinyin you'll see jing mi or you'll see gung mi, but the Chinese character will be the same. And we say non-glutinous rice. And so if you don't know a whole lot about rice, we say non-glutinous rice, um, 
rice doesn't have gluten in it. We're not – that when we say glutinous, we don't mean gluten like wheat gluten that you find in bread. When we say glutinous versus non-glutinous rice, we're talking about is it sticky. And that stickiness doesn't come from a gluten protein. That stickiness comes from like – amylase and stuff like that. Anyway, we're talking about sticky versus non-sticky rice that if you were making something like mochi, you would use a, a sweet sticky rice. And sushi, I'm not sure if that's considered sticky rice or not. It's a shorter grain, but anyway, if you're if you're just like making jasmine rice, that would be a non-sticky rice, a non-glutinous rice. So that's what we mean when we say non-glutinous rice. We mean not the sticky rice that you use to make mochi. Anyway, it's a grain. We talk about postnatal chi as the, the chi of grain and water. It's a grain, so it tonifies spleen chi and lung chi. Tonifies yang. I, I think some books they say will put this in the tonify yang category. And it also generates fluids and alleviates there. So I just put this in there because we do have one or two formulas where it does come up. It will say add some non glutinous rice, and it is on the NCCM list. So I just like to put it in there just for the sake of, sake of completeness. Um, but that's jingmi or gungmi, non-glutinous rice. So that's our category, herbs that tonify chi. After this, what I like to do is sometimes just mention some formulas where these herbs pop up. Now, this is not meant to be a formula class, but sometimes when you see these, these herbs in formulas, it can give you a better idea of how these herbs are used and what kind of functions we like to emphasize. So here are just a couple formulas. Turns out there's a lot of formulas that tonify chi, so I do have a separate video on the YouTube channel about uh, look for Sujun Zetong for Gentleman Decoction that has a lot of chi tonifying herbs. And so I'll put some links below if you want to check out some more formula videos where these herbs are used to tonify chi. But our main formula for tonifying uh, spleen chi is Sujun Zetong for Gentleman Decoction. And so this is just a basic formula for spleen chi deficiency. And so the things we talked about, pale complexion, low and soft voice, uh, reduced appetite, loose stools, weakness in the limbs because the spleen governs the forelimb. The tongue is pale. I have a very pale, puffy tongue with teeth marks. That's a spleen deficiency tongue. And the pulse is going to be deficient or frail. Um, so you can see here we're, we're just using a lot of our herbs that we learned in this category. Ren Shen and Baiju we learned in this category. Ren Shen tonifies all the chi. Baiju specifically tonifies spleen chi. Jir Gan Sao is the honey prepared Gan Sao, the honey prepared licorice. So it's very good for tonifying spleen chi. And then we also add in Fu Ling, which is an herb that we learned earlier. So we're kind of just putting together some spleen chi tonics and saying this formula tonifies the spleen. Really when we talk about uh, these herbs, any, really any two of these herbs could be considered a Dwei Yao pair. The one I usually like to emphasize is this pair of herbs Baiju plus Fu Ling, because this is a very interesting combination that, remember, Baiju comes from this category, herbs that tonify Qi, but Fu Ling is an herb that we learned earlier in the herbs that drain dampness category. So with Baiju, it tonifies Qi because it's, it's sweet in flavor, but it also has a bitterness that dries out dampness. So we're dealing with the spleen Qi deficiency, but also any resulting dampness. Whereas with Fu Ling, it's in the drain dampness category. So it promotes urination to get rid of dampness. That's why it's bland in flavor to promote urination, but it's also sweet in flavor to tonify the Qi. So it's kind of like both herbs are doing both things, but I think really we could say that the Baiju is majorly for tonifying Qi, Fu Ling is majorly for draining dampness. And this is a really nice combination because those two things tend to go together. When you have spleen Qi deficiency, that can lead to dampness, damp accumulation, but when you have dampness, that can very easily encumber the spleen and lead to spleen chi deficiency. So it's kind of like a chicken and an egg sort of thing, but here we're using a combination of herbs that takes care of both at the same time. So we're treating both the root and the branch by tonifying the chi and draining the dampness or drying the dampness. So that's Sujun Zetong for Gentleman Decoction. We have a lot of other spleen tonifying formulas that are based on this and based on this Dwei Yao Pair by Ju plus Fu Ling. Another formula that can see has this in it is Shen Ling Bai Ju Song, Ginseng Poria and White Attractylodes Powder. Shen Ling Bai Ju Song. And this is for spleen qi deficiency, specifically when there's dampness and when our main symptom of dampness is diarrhea. So loose stools or diarrhea. And then we also have these other signs of uh, spleen chi deficiency. The tongue is pale with a white coat because of the dampness and the pulse is thin or moderate. 
But here we started out with our four gentlemen, Ren Chen Baiju, Fu Ling, Dragon Sao. Ren Chen tonifies all the chi, Baiju tonifies spleen chi, Fu Ling drains dampness, but also has a sweet flavor that tonifies. Dragon Sao is the honey fried licorice that tonifies spleen chi. But then notice we also have some other herbs here like Shan Yao, Chinese yam or mountain yam to uh, tonify the spleen. And here we have Bai Biendo, hyacinth bean. Remember we said Bai Biendo tonifies the spleen, but specifically for dampness and diarrhea. And that's where it's being used here. This is for spleen chi deficiency with dampness and diarrhea. So this is a place where we use Bai Biendo because of those functions. And you can see we there are some other herbs we've already learned as well. So you remember Yi Yi Ren is Job's Tears. Uh, that's from the drain dampness category as well. So both Fu Ling and Yi Yi Ren, the, what they had in common is they both had this action of draining dampness, but also tonifying the spleen. So that's a um, something we've learned before. And then Sha Ren is cardamom from the aromatic transform dampness. So here we have this combination of herbs that some of our herbs are tonifying the spleen, some of the herbs are draining dampness, drying dampness, or transforming dampness, getting rid of the dampness, and some of the herbs are treating diarrhea as well. So basically, it's kind of like we're at the point in herbs when we're, we can start to really analyze these formulas and we can start to understand the formulas in terms of the ingredients. So that's what I just want to do here as a review. We have another formula here, a very famous formula called Bujong Ichi Tong, tonify the middle to augment the chi decoction. And this is a formula for spleen chi deficiency, but specifically with those sinking conditions where the spleen is deficient so it can't raise the clear yang of the chi. So here it's actually used for three different patterns, but what these all have in common is spleen chi failing to rise or middle jiao sinking condition. So we can say spleen stomach deficiency unable to raise the clear. So we have this dizziness, unsteadiness, impaired uh, or unclear vision, deafness, tinnitus, shortness of breath. Basically there's not enough chi going upward into the head to nourish the senses. And so we get these things like dizziness, uh, tinnitus, um, unclear vision. We can have chi deficiency fever. This is kind of weird that it's like fever that's worse on exertion, but it does have to do with the spleen not being able to raise the clear that when the spleen can't raise the clear, the yang chi gets constrained and you end up with like fever. It's weird, don't worry about it too much. But then we have sinking of middle jiao chi and here we have our sinking conditions, things like hemorrhoids, rectal or uterine prolapse, prolapse of internal organs, chronic diarrhea, irregular uterine bleeding, or loose stools, that the chi is not, the spleen is not lifting things up, so things sink downward as an organ prolapse. So you can see here that we use something that's similar to uh, our four gentlemen decoction, Ren Chen Baiju Jirgansau. We deleted the Fu Ling because Fu Ling has a downward direction, that's not what we want, but we added in the Huang Qi because Huang Qi tonifies spleen Qi, but it also has that upward direction. And then there are those two that we learned earlier, Sheng Ma and Chai Hu, which also are lifting herbs. So this is a very commonly used formula and this is a very common question they like to ask on year ends, finals and boards about what are the three herbs that raise the clear yang of the spleen or raise the spleen qi to treat sinking conditions. So Huang Qi from this category, Sheng Ma and Chai Hu from the care category. Yi Ping Feng San, Jade Windscreen Powder. I think this has a pretty name. This is for deficiency of the exterior or deficiency of the Wei Qi. So aversion to drafts, recurrent colds, it's easy to get sick. Or um, you also say here, it stops sweating. So remember when we said in, in Chinese medicine that when you get sick, it's like an external attack of wind. Well, here we're putting up a jade windscreen so the wind can't get through. So that's the name of this formula. And you can see we have Huang Qi and Bai Ju here, both because they have this action of stopping sweating. So I bring this up to emphasize this action that Huang Qi tonifies spleen Qi, but also tonifies lung Qi, tonifies the Wei Qi, and stabilizes the exterior. Bai Ju also has an option as an uh, action of stabilizing the exterior and stopping sweating. This is an example of them being used for uh, either spontaneous sweating or easy to catch colds. Um, I hope this is the last one. Jurgan Sao Tong, prepared licorice decoction. I would just like to bring this up because this is our uh, example of using licorice for heart chi deficiency. So this, we say it augments chi, blood, and yin. 
restores the pulse. This is for specifically for palpitation and an irregular pulse. We can say consistently irregular or slow irregular. These are these are irregular pulses due to deficiency. That if we have um, chi deficiency and blood deficiency, the pulse is going to be slow. Or if it's irregular, it's um, we said it's like a person who's who's really tired, so they take five steps and they have to stop and take a break. Then they take five steps and they have to stop and take a break. So that's good. what's going to happen to the pulse when the heart chi is deficient. The, the heart beats for five beats and then has to stop and rest. And then beats for five beats and then it has to stop and take a rest. So that's why we have an irregular pulse. And I just like to bring this up because our two herbs, Jurgansao and Renshen, are there to tonify heart chi. So those are the two herbs in this category that specifically tonify heart chi. Wager is also there, cinnamon twig, remember that had an action of, um, besides releasing the exterior, it also warms the chest, so that's why Guajur is there. Oh, we do have one more. Ganmai uh, Datsao Tong, licorice, uh, licorice, wheat, and jujube decoction. This is for something called restless organ disorder, Zhang Zhao in um, Chinese. This is not a nice thing to say, but sometimes we can think of Zhang Zhao as like hysteria, which is something that a term that I don't think we use anymore. But it was um, disor disorientation, frequent attacks of melancholy and crying spells, inability to control oneself emotionally. Um, so crying, melancholy. Um, sometimes what I use an example of this is like postpartum depression. Um, but here we have our two herbs, Gansao and Datsao. Gansao tonifies heart chi. Datsao was that one that um, uh, ton nourishes blood to calm Shen. And so here we're saying this is nourishing the heart, calming the spirit, but also harmonizing the middle jowl. So this would, this would be another one either like postpartum, postpartum depression. It's like you've lost a lot of chi and blood. And because of that chi and blood deficiency, uh, you just feel really down. You have melancholy. Um, uh, easily upset or easily uh, easily have bouts of crying. Uh, or we can think of this as like a spleen and heart thing, that if you have excessive worry, um, you're thinking too much, you're worrying too much, that can damage the spleen and upset the heart. So this is one that uh, can be used for that. And this is very common to use just like when people want to give like a sample of herbal formulas. It's very easy to make. The, the ingredients are very simple and it kind of tastes good too. That It's licorice root, so it's sweet. Um, it's red date, so it's sweet. So it kind of tastes good. So it's very easy to use as a sample. I know that there are some people that if they had an herb shop, they would just always have like a pot of this. And so instead of giving someone a bottle of water or offering someone some tea when they come in, they would say, would you like to try some of this happy tea, this Gan Mai Da Zao Tong? So that's a, an example of using Gan Zao and Da Zao to nourish the heart and calm the spirit. So those are our herbs that tonify qi. Just do a quick review. Ren Chen tonifies all the qi. Tonifies spleen qi, tonifies lung qi, tonifies heart qi, and it also treats uh, qi due to collapse. Uh, but beside that, it also generates fluid, so we should know that's moistening as well. Dang Shen is often used as a substitute for Ren Shen. We have to double the dosage because it's not um, quite as strong. Uh, some people will say it generates fluids and some people say it doesn't. Taitsa Shen, another one that's weaker than uh, ginseng, but often used as a substitute. So we use a higher dosage. This is prince root, so it's not as good as the king, but we can uh, use it for mild conditions or with um, children. But it also tonifies qi and generates fluids. Huang Qi, astragalus, uh, tonifies lung Qi, especially for strengthening the exterior, strengthening the Wei Qi and stopping sweating. It tonifies spleen Qi, uh, especially for raising the clear yang of the spleen. It also promotes urination to drain dampness and regenerates flesh. Baiju, think of the middle jiao, spleen, stomach. Baiju tonifies the spleen. It also... Um, has an action of stopping sweating, but tonifies spleen. It dries dampness, which is also a spleen thing, and it uh, calms restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. Gansao is licorice root, has a lot of different functions, but it uh, tonifies qi, especially tonifies spleen qi. It tonifies heart qi, like we saw for uh, irregular pulse and palpitations, but it also clears heat toxicity, it relieves spasms, and it harmonizes and moderates other herbs. Shan Yao is mountain yam, so think about um, tonifying the spleen, tonifying the lung, but also does something for the kidney 
as well. Datsao is a Chinese date, especially good for tonifying the spleen, but also nourishes heart to calm Shen. Bai Bian Do is hyacinth bean, uh, tonifies the spleen chi, but especially good for dampness and diarrhea. So for Bai Bian Do, think dampness and diarrhea. Huang Jing, Solomon Seal, not a very commonly used ones, but you can think Huang Jing is good for the Jing, it tonifies kidney essence, but it also tonifies uh, spleen and lung chi and generates fluids or tonifies lung and stomach yin. Some people put this in the tonify yin category. Yi Tong is maltose, tonifies the spleen, especially for abdominal pain. So those are our formula, or those are our herbs that tonify chi. Uh, like we said, in this video, what we're doing is we're going through this category very in depth. So this is very good if you're learning these herbs for the first time, if you're in an herbology three class and you're taking a weekly quiz. If, however, you're at the end of your studies and you're taking finals or year ends or boards and you wanna review all of the herbs, then we do have a herb review course which goes over all of the herbs, but does it much more quickly. So instead of going it through this in-depth where we take two hours to talk about a single category, this, uh, this course goes through all the herbs very quickly. So we're going through every category and sometimes it's just like 10 or 15 minutes. So we're just hitting on the key points of each herb. So this is a course that's on Teachable that is meant to review all of uh, herbs one, two, and three. So, um, Sorry, that's the formula one. So it starts out by talking about the properties of the herbs, all that stuff we talked about in the very beginning of a class that you probably forgot about, things like taste, temperature, entering channel, methods of preparation, like stir frying an herb in honey versus stir frying an herb in alcohol, the different types of combination, mutual extension, mutual enhancement, uh, the, 18 fee the 18 incompatibilities and the 19 fears all those things, and then some common Chinese terms that we kind of talk about when we talk about the names of this. Then we briefly talk about herb categories, and so some basic basic strategies for answering questions based on knowing the category, and then we just go through and review every, every category. And again, when we go through these, it's not meant to be in depth. Here, we're just hitting on the key points for each herb. So when we look at this, we're just looking at um, the major functions that stand out for each herb. So this is a very quick way to review all of the herbs if you don't need all of this in-depth information. So there's uh, information on every category. There's a few bonuses at the end where we talk about um, herbs for Shang Han Lun and Wen Bing, and we talk about the secondary functions of herbs, and we talk about things like herbs that clear summer heat, herbs that brighten the eyes, or herbs that a uh, calm, restless fetus to prevent miscarriage. These herbs don't have their own category. They're kind of scattered throughout all the different categories. So we talk about all those in one. So this is a way that you can uh, study all the herbs if you're studying for finals or year ends or boards. Again, it goes through all the herbs. And this is, um, this is not a subscription. I think there are a lot of other review courses where there's either a subscription or there's limited access. With this one, when you buy it once, you own it forever. So the idea here is if you're in herbs class, you could use this to study for your finals. If you have first year ends, you can use this to study for first year ends. Then you can use it again for second year ends. And then you can use it again when you get to boards. So once you purchase this course, you own it forever. You can use it as many times as you want. And like I said, we just went over some formulas. There's also a formula review course. If you're uh, starting formula class or you have second year ends or boards, there's a similar uh, course that just goes through all of the formulas. These are all the formulas on the NCCM list. And here we're going through all the formulas and mentioning, uh, kind of like this, mentioning the ingredients and how they're used in each formula. So if you're studying for second year ends or for boards, you can go to the formula review course. Again, this is something that you buy it once and you own it forever. So you could use it for formula class, use it for second year ends, use it for boards. There's a lot of handouts that go with it. There's a lot of practice uh, questions that go with it. I actually just went through and added um, more practice questions for e every category. So there's a, a practice test for each category, and then there's a practice test at the end of each module. So there's a lot of practice questions there as well, as well as some handouts, notes, and other things that can help you review these herbs quickly. So just wanted to bring that up. If you're uh, getting to the end of your studies and you're, uh, 
you're in the mood for some review rather than listening to herbs at Tonify Chi for two hours, that is another option. So thank you for being here. Um, uh, like I said, there are notes, flashcards, and a practice test you can take. There's links to that below. And also thank you to the Patreon members who support the website, the YouTube channel, and everything I do there. So um, what I do is not possible without your support and, your, and without your donation. So to everyone who supports this uh, YouTube channel, thank you. If you'd like to support it, uh, there are some links below. You can either join the Patreon, that's like a monthly subscription, or you can make a one-time donation through Buy Me A Coffee. Uh, something I have started doing is there are some special videos on the Patreon feed as well, where I started a, a, a exclusive series there uh, I'm calling TCM Talks, and uh, kind of like TED Talks, but about Chinese medicine. Um, so the first one there is up where it's uh, three stories about uh, Chinese medicine. I talk about approaching complex cases. We uh, talk about the story of the dexterous butcher from the Zhuangzi. And uh, we talk about the story of uh, Cao Cao and Wu Mei, this, uh, this idiom, thinking of plums to quench one's thirst. So if you want to support the channel, uh, that's the way you can do it is by joining the Patreon. There's a link to that below, and that will also get you access to this uh, exclusive series where I just ramble about whatever is on my mind. But uh, thank you for being here for Herb Review. Uh, we'll see you in the next one, which is herbs that tonify blood, going into the second category of the tonifying herbs. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time.